God bless you. We're glad to come into your homes. Amen. Again, be our social media to share the things that concern the kingdom of God with you. The Lord bless you in the precious name of the Lord. Amen to all of those of you that are chiming in on this Wednesday Bible study night. Praise the Lord. It is a blessing to be alive. Glad to be in the number one more time. The Lord is certainly good. Listen, his mercy endureth forever. I will say of the Lord that he is good. Listen, and his mercy, it endureth forever. So we thank the Lord, amen, for his wonderful goodness, amen, and kindness that he had bestowed upon the children of men. God bless you, Mother Jefferson. Amen. I like your hallelujah anyhow. <clears throat> Amen. Praise the Lord to Sister Bree Terry. The Lord bless you, daughter. And to Brother Sean. God bless you, son. And to Sister Haley Waters. The Lord bless you. Praise the Lord. God bless all of those of you that are tuning in. In the precious name of Jesus, we are glad for your tuning on this evening. I want you to get a Bible, get to a place where you can always say this, where you can tune in to the things that concern the kingdom of God and his Christ. Praise the Lord to those uh, that are with us on um, Facebook. Praise the Lord to our Facebook family and to our, um, also our um, YouTube family. The Lord bless you and thank God for you. God bless you, Sister Waters. Uh, Sister Sheena, what's up, Sheena? Praise God, good to see you. Good evening, God bless. And to Sister Mika Penny, praise the Lord to you, daughter. The Lord bless you. It was good to see you all on Sunday to... Jamal Holmes Jr., the Lord bless you. And to Deacon Clark, the Lord bless you. Good to see you all on Sunday, you and Sister Clark. God bless you, Minister Matthews. Praise the Lord to you. And to Malachi Clark, good to see you, son. God bless. And God bless you, Sister Manns. Praise the Lord to you. And to Lady Gardner, God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless. Amen. Sister Archie, Sister Ingrid Archie and the Archie family. Deacon Archie, the Lord bless you. God bless you, Greg Moore, and God bless the Moore family. Praise the Lord and to cherish your moment. God bless you. To Sister Daniel Cook, praise the Lord. The Lord bless you. Praise the Lord. Hey, Sheena, God bless. Praise the Lord. Amen. As the saints are tuning in, uh, we just, we're just giving you just a few minutes. Amen. Glory to God until we get ready to, amen, really talk about the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Lord is good. And listen, his mercy and his favor. God bless you, Brother Jeremiah. To Sister Ramona Reddick, praise him. I like that, praise him. And if you want to short abbreviate that, you can just put PH, Sister Reddick, if you want to. And if you don't feel like top typing out the whole thing, but amen. God bless you. And uh, I see people wearing out that PTL. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God bless you, Sister Wally. Praise the Lord. Amen. I like the way that you all are referring to each other as family because we are family. We are a part of the body of Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. And that's a wonderful, wonderful way to look at one another. God bless you, Sister Alicia Johnson, Griffin Johnson. The Lord bless you. Praise the Lord to you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Glory, 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 glory. Amen. I see somebody got some good news and big smiley faces up there. That's all good. Ah, mm -hmm. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Wonderful Jesus. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. And so we're just preparing. I want you to get into a good place now where we can really dig into God's word. Amen. Praise the Lord to hear and to understand the things that concern the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Uh, Deacon Rogers, I didn't see him up there. Deacon, uh, Deacon Ross, God bless. Praise the Lord. To Sister Latasha Holmes, the Lord bless you. Praise the Lord to you. Amen. Uh, I cannot see everybody that's on. Sometimes people come on and they don't want you to know that they're on. But it's all right to let us know that you're on. It's almost like being accountable coming to church. You don't have to hide. Amen. And it's all right to say, hey, I'm here. Praise the Lord. Wonderful Jesus. Um, so we thank God for those of you that are tuning in. God bless you, Jay Toon. Praise the Lord to you, son. Praise the Lord to you. Praise God. Uh, so in just a few minutes, we're going to dig into the Word of God. Remember, get to a place now where you can sit and you can examine yourself as the Word of God is going forward. forward. So the man said the volume is a little low. Praise the Lord. I want to address you. I want to address you as I see that you're talking to me. I'm talking to you. All right. So um, God bless you. We'll work on that. Maybe it's just me um, and my tone. Praise God. 
Hopefully you can hear me a little louder, man. Praise the Lord, Minister Patterson. Praise the Lord, sir. The Patterson family. Praise God to you all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Glory to God. Uh, yes, God bless Pastor Span and Pastor Moore. Praise the Lord, Pastor Span. God bless you. Uh, Deacon Spears, praise him. Glory to God. God bless you, Elder Gray. The Lord bless you. Greetings to you. Praise the Lord. Okay, Sister Regina, it's better. Thank you. Go, go too fast. I, I need to see. Jenny said it's better. Okay, good. It was probably more me, and I don't mind projecting out. God bless you, Sister Rashid Stafford. Praise the Lord to your daughter and to uh, the White family. Praise the Lord. I love the way that you all address each other as family. You are family. We are family, and you have to remember that. Praise the Lord. So now we can say PHF, praise him family. <laughs> or PTL, praise the Lord. PTL, praise the Lord family. Amen. And so that's that's wonderful. Praise the Lord. All right, thank you. They said in the volume is great now. So uh, I'll just move it up a little closer to myself so you can hear me a little, project a little bit more. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Amen. Pray. Are you in a good place? Do you have a good reading Bible? I want to make sure that you have a good reading Bible. Amen. That's with you. God bless you, Sierra Lucas. Praise the Lord, daughter. Praise the Lord, Glory and Sister Gloria. God bless you, daughter. God bless. Praise the Lord. Always good to good to see you all on Sunday. Praise the Lord. I like the PTLF. Praise the Lord, family. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to be alive. Glad to be in the land of the living one more time. Amen. Praise the Lord. Full of power, full of health and strength. Praise the Lord. God bless you, Sister. Parker Ross, Stacia Parker Ross, praise the Lord to you. The Lord bless you. Amen. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. And to your family. God bless. Praise the Lord. Friends and family. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. And so I want you to uh, prepare yourself again as we can dig into the word of the Lord and see the things that concern the kingdom of God and his Christ. Praise the Lord. Uh, God bless you. Praise the Lord. Yes, to all the saints of Shekinah. The Lord bless you. Love all of y'all. Bless you, Sister Wiggins. I understand that you had an anniversary. God bless you and happy anniversary to you. And Brother Wiggins, the Lord bless you all. Amen. And we are right around the corner. I know that uh, Quan, uh, Deacon Quan, and uh, Sister Kenya also had an anniversary. Praise the Lord. It's Tuesday. It's, it was right. I said they had an anniversary. Praise God. Um, and so we thank God, amen, that people are celebrating amen. and that they are celebrating each other. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you can celebrate life, but what good is life without each other? Praise the Lord. What good is life without Christ? Amen. You can celebrate life, but what good is life without Christ? What good is life without each other? Praise the Lord. God bless you. Yes, yeah, so happy anniversary to those of you that have, that have had anniversaries on this month. Praise the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. And you know that Quan and Brandon, they just had to get married in my month. Praise the Lord. Sucking up some of my month. I guess they let me know the month don't belong to me. Praise the Lord. But God bless. Just, just wonderful. Isn't it wonderful? Amen. To be alive. Listen. And to have a good spirit about being alive. Because there are a lot of people that are alive and they have the worst attitude. God bless you, Sister Wiggins. My joy to you. God bless you all. Amen. It is good to be alive and have a good attitude about living. Praise the Lord. And, and in particular, living in Christ Jesus. My God, glory, glory to God. Praise the Lord. And so that's, that's wonderful. Praise the Lord. Yes, the White's anniversary is in September. That's right. They sucked up some of my time too, Sister Wally. Amen. <laughs> they sucked up some of my time. The White's just had an anniversary. But it's all right. I don't mind sharing. God bless you, Sister Diane Wilson. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. Praise the Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. All right, so please make sure that you have your Bible. You are in a good place. You don't need to be so mobile. I know you're at home, but when you're honoring God, take time to sit. Because I can actually walk and talk, but I'm not walking and talking. I'm sitting because I want to honor the Lord. I want to give attention to what I'm sharing with you and attention to the Lord. Praise the Lord as we um, begin to go forward in the things of the Lord. Praise the Lord. So one of my sons that is out pastoring, Elder Love, his anniversary, this is his second year anniversary, and I'll be sharing with him on tomorrow. Praise the Lord. The pandemic did not allow us to meet physically. 
amen, for churches physically. But I'm proud that he has stuck in there and hung in there. And we have other sons uh, that are on their way out too, amen, on their way out to do works. Not everybody will pastor. But some people will do evangelistical work. There are many works, to, much work to be done. And pastoring is not the only work to do. Praise the Lord. And sometimes uh, people, they, they look at work as though it's the only work to do. But however, amen, it is so much work to do, amen, in the Lord. And what we have to do is make sure that when we do it, we understand that we are not the only ones doing it. That God have other people that are also doing the work of the Lord as well. Can anyone please help with my two kids there and need their diapers and breast cancer? All right, please get that number, please. And um, uh, Linnell C. Fawali. Praise the Lord. Please, uh, somebody uh, uh, get that information. Praise the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. And I want to, yeah, we'll check into Sister, F is that Linnell? C. Fawali. Okay, Fawali. Okay, she's in Chicago. All right, listen, we, please make sure we get that. Uh, Liz in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Okay, please, we want to be able to help in any way that we could. In the precious name of the Lord, God bless you. In Jesus' name, stay tuned in, sister, for a while, and we'll, we'll get with you. Amen. Before the close of this broadcast. All right? The Lord bless. God bless you. In the name of the Lord, amen. God bless. All right, are you in a place now? Are you in a place, amen, where we can share the word with you? Amen. Are you in a place where we can share the word with you? Amen. On today. I want to talk to you today about the perversion of Teshuba. The perversion of Teshuba. The perversion of Teshuba. Praise the Lord. That's what I want to talk to you. God bless you, Sister Tiffany. Praise the Lord. The Lord bless you. Yes, the perversion of Teshuba. T-E-S-H-U-B-A-H. That's what I want to share with you. And I'll explain it's a simple word. A simple uh, Hebrew word that we want to share with you, or Teshuba. Amen. Praise God. We want to share with you. Now, uh, glory to God. All right. Today it is clear that this country, um, as we, we, we live in, we all live, uh, most of us that are tuned in, we are all in the same. Hey, Tiffany. Tiffany Johnson. God bless you, sweetie. Good to see you. Praise the Lord. Good to see you. Uh, now, it is, it, is, it is clear that this country... This, these Americas, all right, these Americas, uh, this country, have turned from God. That's clear that the country have turned from God. Even with all of the warnings and the calamities that we have experienced, that was really the mercy of God to provoke the country to turn back to him. That's what it was. It was God's way of provoking the country to turn back to him. Praise the Lord. And uh, rather than turn from sin and turn to God, the world have waxed worse. The world have gotten worse. They, they, they took prayer out of the schools. We know that they took it out, but they, they remind us. Praise the Lord, Mother Dunham. God bless you. Pray, they remind us that prayer was taken out of the schools. Then they removed the Ten Commandments from every public place, including the courts and the other places they used to be posted. So it is clear that this country had turned from God. And with all of the warnings and calamities, that was God's mercy. That was God's mercy to provoke the country to turn back to him. And again, rather than turn from sin and turn to God, the world had waxed worse. Again, they've taken the prayer out of the schools. And they make that clear. They remove the Ten Commandments from out of the courts and out of public places they used to be. Praise the Lord. Amen. Posted. And this country had literally placed God on the back burner. When we misplaced God, it left a breach, an opening for the enemy to come in and do damage in this country. Because when you, when you misplace God, everything is misplaced. The value of family, you can't see this. The value of prayer. When you misplace God, everything is misplaced. All of our values are misplaced. God bless you, Mother Johnson. Mother Thomasina Johnson. The Lord bless you. All right? So when we misplace God, it, is, it left a breach, an a, a opening for the enemy to come in and damage the country. And they have been, there have been natural disasters that have, should, have, should have wakened this country up. Praise the Lord. That have been natural disasters that should have wakened up the country. Yet people are still asleep 
and their destruction. God bless you, Deacon Rogers, Devil R. So people are, they still sleep in their destruction. Look at all of the things that have happened from the destruction of the Twin Towers, the bombing of the Pentagon, all of, the, all of that loss of life. Look at the financial crisis this country has been in and the snowballing deficit that seems to continue to grow larger. Look at the diseases that hit this country. Look like, now remember, under one president's uh, um, uh, term, he said, listen, America, we are expecting 60 million people to die. They was expecting. Are you listening? Not around the world. 60 million Americans, they were expecting them to die just in 2015. So people are already aware, amen, that, you know, that there are some real, some real evil things that's going on in this world. When you're expecting 60 million people to die, and 60 million didn't die right away. It didn't die that year, and it didn't, uh, you know, not that people wasn't dying, but I'm saying that unusual death from, from a disease, from a specific, you know, uh, um, mishap. It looked like other countries was affected worse than we were at first, and then all of a sudden the tides turned, and here we are the most affected by this deadly virus. Look at 55 million people in this country who are out of jobs, not including those who are not previously working. Then there are 300, 300 and what, 60 or 70 million, 380 million people in this country or so, between 350 to 380 million people, we're past 10%. And we're not even talking about the people who previously was not working. If that's not enough, look at how the wicked embark upon the masses doing the, their vulnerability and their hard times taking advantage of them. And even worse, what about the things that was not caused by the hands of men, like earthquakes, beginning to manifest themselves even more on the East Coast? The East Coast is not really used to earthquakes. The West Coast is more known for earthquakes, but earthquakes on the East Coast? And we're seeing them more frequently. What about that? Praise the Lord. And so I, I want to just point these things out. These earthquakes beginning to manifest themselves on the East Coast. The mudslides and the extreme fires that have turned into infernos over there in California. People are leaving California. I prophesied about seven years ago, and I don't know if you rem remember this, that people from the West need to start leaving and moving further in because I, I saw in the spirit some forks that divided California from the, from the rest of America. Something is going on over there. And it's not that it's not going on there, it's going on everywhere, but they are, they are more advanced to, in, in certain areas of, of ungodliness than the rest of the country is. And we follow right behind them. Not far now. Not far. Earthquakes here in North Carolina. And yet this country is too prideful and stubborn to repent. Rather than say, Lord, have mercy, follow me please, and forgive us, we say we will rebuild. We will rebuild what have been torn down. We will rebuild stronger and better rather than turn from our ways and turn to God. This country, rather than turn to God, this country say, hey, take down the Ten Commandments. Rather than turn to God, this country remove proud of school. This country say, hey, let's legalize marijuana. Are you serious? Those of you in Congress, I'm wondering who in there is Christian. Who in Congress and Senate actually read their Bible? I think we need to rethink about who we put into these places. Everybody that hold the Bible on their hand don't mean they're reading it. Hint, hint. You see, so I'm saying to you, uh, uh, mm -mm. We, we, we're, we're the most gullible people. Christians are so gullible. We get sucked into everything. And yet we get hurt the most. So the country says, hey, forever to turn to the Lord, let's legalize marijuana. Marijuana. Rather than turn to God, let's legalize same-sex marriages. Hey, they say, rather than turn to God, let's teach homosexual agendas in our children, to our children. And I'm telling you, I've heard two times, one teacher in one of my son's class trying to push a homosexual agenda, and I'm going to tell them, 
I'm going to tell them because now this is my house. Right. And I'm going to tell them they're going to be on Zoom in my house. They are not to talk about those kind of, push those kind of agendas in my home. Yeah, I'm getting ready to write a letter right now. That right now, I'm, we at home, we ain't at school. This ain't no public place. This is a private place. And although they may be teaching the children, we have to you know, lay that down. And I have to ask myself, who was that teacher? I got his name, and I mean to address him and address that school. And if you believe that, you take it to where you can preach it. But don't you bring here. We have to learn how to stand up against these things. Yeah, and guess what? And and now they're teaching that the that agenda to our children, and that it is normal. When in the 1960s they said, "Hey, that was a mind problem with people who did that," right? But now they said it is normal. I'm not hating and preaching a hate speech right. on people that struggle with those things because right. God is a deliverer, just like He delivered from liquor and anything else. Yeah. God can deliver from anything. We're talking about God. Tell Remember, yes, His me. name is Elohim. Yes, sir. He does the hardest thing as easy as he does the easiest. Does. It doesn't take God any more power to heal cancer than it does a, a little migraine. So we're talking about God. God can do anything. And so I'm not, you know, trying to pounce on that, but I'm saying it's what's happening, and I'm not going to be quiet about it. Amen. And now they're entertaining, listen at this, saints, passing a law that legalizes pedophilia. Hmm. Yeah, because we sleep. And I've been praying every morning at 5 o'clock. I've been, I thank God for those that have been able to join in. Yep, I pray like my life is on the line. That's right. I pray just like my life is on the line. Amen. Praise the Lord. And um, But however, they're, they're getting ready. They're entertaining passing a law that legalizes pedophilia. Reverend is saying, turn to God. We're getting word further and further away. Can you believe that? So the things that happen that should have spurred this country to repentance have only caused it to turn further away from God. The godly act of Teshuba have been perverted with ungodly teachings and popular concepts that have, listen, praise God, that have led many astray from true repentance. Now, Teshuba is in retrospect to repentance. That's what that Hebrew word means. It means to repent. That's what it means. All right? But there has been a perversion in the doctrine of repentance. Repentance is one of the oldest institutions in the Bible. You see repentance all through the Old Testament. It's emphasized. It is one of the oldest institutions and oldest doctrines in the Word of God. But that has been corrupted and perverted by popular and ungodly teachings, popular concepts that have led many astray from true repentance, and it has affected the church. Yes, T-E-S-H-U-B-A-H. It means to repent. That's what it means. All right? And so I want to, I want to, I want, uh, let's, let's get into this just for a moment. And there are many who are deceived to believe that repentance is an outward act. Some people say, well, I said I'm sorry. Yeah, but it was just an outward act and verb and verbiage saying that you're sorry, but that doesn't make it repentance. And there are people who are immune to practicing outward acts of repentance. You know, rather than saying I'm sorry, they get you a gift. Or try to take you to another level, rather than saying, you know what, I'm sorry, because there's too much pride. There are people that will spend a million dollars. I know somebody said, well, come on, give me the million dollars. You ain't never got to tell me you sorry. Give me the million dollars. And the million dollars may do you good, but the pride is going to land them in hell. You see, so there are people, you know, who, who would rather, you know, they practice the act of repentance. But I, I need you to understand that it is deeper than just an outward act. Repentance, listen to me carefully, is useless when it comes to those who intend to practice ungodliness and repent before doing so. Let me say it again. Repentance is useless. It is useless when it comes to those who intend to practice ungodliness and try to repent before doing so. As though God will grant you mercy as you perform some godly act. You've ever heard people say, Lord, forgive me for what I'm getting ready to do. Wait a minute. That means you know what you're getting ready to do is wrong and you're asking God before you do it to forgive you. And you're going to do it. You're going to repent before and do it after. Oh, no. 
That, that is not God. That is very ungodly. As though God will grant you mercy as you perform some godly act. Remember what ungodliness means. Un means to undo. Ungodly practices mean that a person is undoing things that should be done in a godly manner. So when a person is ungodly, they're undoing godliness. Are you following what I'm saying to you? All right. So I need I need you to understand this. Ungodly practices mean you're undoing things that should be done in a godly manner. So you can't repent before you do evil. You cannot repent before doing evil. Because this means you're very cosmically aware of what you're going to do. And then you actually perform it. Talking about, Lord, forgive me before I do it. No. It doesn't work that way. That is a perversion in the Teshuvah. And people actually believe that they can do that. Yeah, there are Christians that think that that's okay. I said, Lord, forgive me before I did it. No, that's not how that works. Those are ungodly teachings. Those are things that pervert the teaching of <clears throat> repentance. Praise the Lord. Uh, and so I want you to understand, you can't repent before, do, before you do evil. There is also this uprising and popular belief that you can repent after death. And after going to eternal damnation, before Bishop Ellis died, Bishop, praise the Lord, uh, Delano Ellis, God rest his soul and my prayers to his family because he was a man of God and he brought order, amen, to the body of Christ, kind of order, amen, and, and, and a sense of, uh, of dignity to the Pentecostal movement altogether. So he contributed, and that's what he's going to ever be remembered for. He contributed to that as a whole. I pray that I'm able to do that before I'm able to go home to be with the Lord or before the Lord come. But I will say this to you. Let me say this to you. Praise the Lord. Amen. That you cannot repent after you're dead. And there was a segment when when Bish, when uh, uh, in Carlton Pearson's, uh, uh, when he was talking in his movie Sunday, and I'm not on that. I'm just bringing out something. And he asked Bishop Ellis about his father. And he said, well, my father is in hell. And he says, well, do you think he's learned his lesson while he's in hell as though he can repent and get out of hell? Listen, God is an eternal God. And because he's eternal, he has an eternal purpose, even with temporal, even with temporality. His purpose is still eternal. And so when this temporal is over, everything else is in the eternal. And so it's either in eternity with him or in eternity away from him. And if you're away from him now, you'll be away from him then. I need you to understand that. That's, that needs to be very clear. Oh, no. You don't get to repent after you die. And there are people who believe that you can repent after death and after going to eternal damnation. Now, one may say the words, you can end up in hell, and I'm sure there will be a lot of people saying, I'm sorry, or I repent. But they cannot be forgiven after they have died and gone to hell. Now, if repent is what I'm getting ready to tell you, it really is. How are you going to repent after, after life is over? Because repent literally means to turn. It means to return. You see, that's what it means. I'll get into it in just a few minutes. So one may say the words, I'm sorry or I repent, but they cannot be forgiven after they've died and gone to hell. Repentance after death and a person is in hell is gravely useless. It is useless when you're in hell. Now let's get ready to get deep because right now we, we're thinking about sinners, aren't we? We're thinking repentance like people turning from sin. But I need you to follow me just for a moment. I'm sorry, we can't preach things like this right here in certain settings. You won't be allowed to preach this. It would be that you did not preach. But this is the preaching we actually need. You know, shaking in the hand and here, oh, there's more substance than that. Walking pews and, and shaking mics and rolling on the floor. And it's not how high you jump up, but it's how straight you walk when you come down. Listen, I'm trying to tell you. Amen. So repentance after death and, and, and the person in hell is gravely useless. Another perversion of repentance is when the extremity of emotions produce tears and sorrows. So some people feel, you know, they get to that, that they're emotional. 
and the extremity of the emotions um, produce tears and sorrow. And there are people who feel like because their emotions produce tears and sorrow that that was repentance. They think that anguishes and agonies that lead to bewailing and lamentations produces repentance. But anguishes and agonies that leads to, praise God, lamentations does not mean that it is true repentance. Can I prove that? Because there are those who believe because they confess some godly thing in their lives that they are free and in good standing because they verbally admitted it. No, all you did was admit it. It don't mean that you turn from it. And there are people who feel like that they're free. Yes, I admitted that I was wrong. And it's like, so what? I told you, my bad. <laughs> I told you I made a mistake. What else you want? No, it's not what else you want. Admitting you wrong don't mean that you are sorry for, that you're wrong. You can admit you did something. Yeah, I did it. I admit that I did it. Yes, I admit, you know, I'm not saying that I do this, but I'm saying, quote, unquote, yes, quote, yes, I, I admit that I smoke cigarettes, unquote. And so you get around people and you light up because you feel like you admit it that you smoke so you good and you in the clear because at least you told the truth about yourself. It ain't the truth about yourself. It's about the truth that he presents to us. It's about the grace and truth through Jesus Christ, not just about the truth about yourself. Uh-uh. No, no, no. It's about what the Lord said. It's what the Lord said. So just admitting that you're wrong or having some, you know, uh, 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 lamentation of wrongness or anguish and agonies that lead to bewailing and lamentations, that don't mean that's true repentance. There are those who believe that they can, because they confess ungodly things in their lives, that they're free and in good standing because they verbally admit it. Listen to me. Merely realizing and confessing that something is wrong is only promulgation. That's all it is. One only exceeds and confirms the wrong but may I ask you, is that repentance because someone confirmed that what they did or what they said or what they're doing is wrong? Is that repentance? Is that real repentance? These are some of the things that have perverted the real meaning of repentance. Remember what the New Testament said about Esau in Hebrews 12 and 17. Can somebody get that? Hebrews 12 and 17. Can we read that? For ye know how that afterwards. Now listen at this carefully. You know how afterwards. When he would have inherited the blessings. When Esau could have inherited the blessings. He was rejected. He was rejected. When he found no place of repentance. He found no place. It wasn't that it wasn't there. He wasn't looking for it. He found no place of repentance. Go ahead. Though he sought it carefully. Look, with tears. though he sought it carefully with tears. Oh, he was emotional about it. Esau had emotions about this. But it said he found no place for repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He was emotional. There was some sorrow there. There was some anguish and agonies that was right there, and bewailings and lamentations. But he never repented. How about Cain who killed his brother? And remember, he was there the same way. That anguish on him, Lord, when the Lord said, you know, I'm going to all of the punishment that would come on him for what he did. He was like, oh, it's more than I could bear. It was almost like, Lord, you know, it was that anguish, uh, like, like, you know, a sense of, a sense of uh, sorrowfulness. But he didn't turn. The Bible says right after he did it, he left the presence of the Lord. He left God's presence. I want you to understand this, saints of God. Praise the Lord. That Esau, he sought for repentance, listened with tears. But never found it. And there are believers who are under the same assumption that as long as they have repented for their sins to Jesus, that they're in the clear. Now, people don't have a problem in church repenting to Jesus, but I guarantee you this there will be more people in hell for unforgiveness. More Christians will be in hell for any other, you know what? More Christians will be in hell for unforgiveness than any other sin. Because we're some of the ones who perverted this concept of repentance. When is the last time you've seen a strong leader stand up and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Lord, forgive me for, for I'm wrong and lead people to repentance because the Old Testament prophets, they led the congregation into repentance. 
They wasn't sitting there trying to make, that's what the Pharisees did, trying to make everybody else repent while you looking like you all right. They led the people to repentance. So yes, I'm leading us to repentance on tonight. Yes, I am. Because there are a lot of believers and they think, well, I'm a believer. Yes, I'm a believer. But they will not forgive. <laughs> and you walking around like you saved and you shouting. Listen what I'm trying to tell you. I don't care if you go to church and you say that you saved and sanctified. But you're not sanctified unto the Lord because if you don't forgive, let me explain this to you. If you haven't forgiven somebody for the last 10 years, you, Lord, forgive me. But the other person, I can't forgive them for what they did. And it's in your actions. You ain't got to say it with your mouth. A lot of times people say that they forgive with their mouth. They haven't forgiven. They're lying. They're not telling the truth. Your actions prove you didn't forgive because you made no effort to reconcile. You didn't forgive. Well, I don't have to go back to people. Well, those in Christ, how are you going to go to heaven with somebody for eternity unless you think they're going to hell? How are you going to go to heaven with someone for eternity that you can't forgive down here on this earth? So what I'm trying to tell you, there will be more saints in hell, believers in hell with unbelievers. There will be more believers in hell with unbelievers for unforgiveness than any other sin. You got to repent, not only repent to the Lord, you got to forgive other people. And can I be honest with you? Because there are those who are under the assumption that as long as you have repented to Jesus, that you're in the clear. But that I got to be honest with you, that's far from the truth. If you repented to the Lord for sins, but did not forgive a brother or sister for some wrong committed against you, you are not forgiven by God. You got that for me? Give me the, it's in the book of Matthew. Yeah, Matthew 6, chapter. Read Matthew. Lord's Prayer. Okay, no, 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 I know that one where he says, forgive us our trespasses, we forgive those who, as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's in the Lord's Prayer, but then Jesus also said, if you don't forgive your brother, your heavenly father will not forgive you. Okay, so where we at, where we at, where we at? Matthew 6 and 15. Matthew 6 and 15, that's still where the Lord's Prayer is. Look at verse 14, please. Hold on, hold on. Matthew 6 and 14, I want you to get that. Because we, we pray in the Lord's Prayer, but we're just like skipping all over it. One of the parts of that prayer is forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. we even praying that prayer. We're praying that prayer. That's, a, that's an acknowledgement. I realize that you will not forgive mine if I don't forgive others. So it's more than just Jesus dying on the cross. Oh, he died on the cross, but if you don't forgive other people, you are not forgiven. You are still having your sins. And if it's been 10 years ago, that all the, throughout them 10 years that you ask God to forgive you, all them sins are still on you. You are no better. It's almost like you're still in the world of sin and shame. It's like you've never been regenerated. It's like you've ignored the power of the cross. Because you can't apply the power of the forgiveness of the cross to yourself and restrict it from everybody else. Is, is anybody hearing me? Please hear when I, what I'm saying to you. Read that scripture, please, for uh, chapter 6, Matthew 6 and 14. Read it. For if you forgive men their trespasses. Jesus said, if you forgive men their trespasses. Your heavenly Father will, your also, heavenly Father forgive will also forgive you. But if you forgive not but men their you trespasses. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses. Neither will your Father forgive your Neither trespasses. will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. Did you see that? That's in the Bible. And there are a lot of people that's on their way to hell talking about, Lord, forgive me. You think you straight, but you have done damage and you think it's OK just to walk on in your life doing. I'm talking about even the damage to people in the body of Christ. You know, you did damage and you won't even say, look, I'm sorry. Let's get you up to par. Let's bring you where you should be. Let's build you up. You hacked on people and tore people to pieces and these kind of things and never went back to say you were sorry. And yet you're asking God to forgive you, but you haven't released anybody else. You've not forgiven them. <laughs> You've held them to condemnation. Lord, have mercy. So more believers, and I'm candid about this, more believers will find themselves in hell for unforgiveness than any sin that can be committed. Now, it's true. You had better ask God to forgive you. But he says, 
The Bible says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind, thy strength, and thy soul. And the second commandment is likened to the first one, that you're to love your neighbor as yourself. So you can't ask God to forgive you and don't ask others to forgive you and or do not forgive others. Uh-huh. So I, 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 let, me, let, me, let, me, let me close this out because this is some deep stuff. More believers, I'm telling you, will find themselves in hell for unforgiveness and any sin that can be committed. Why is it that Christians struggle with forgiving? We're always in Jesus' face saying, forgive me. But we struggle with forgiving other people. <laughs> let, let me briefly explain the nature of repentance. I'm closing. Repentance require more than outward acts. True repentance is a verb. It is not just something you say. It is something you also do. Repentance. Tashiba. Or Tashuba. Shub means to return. That's what Shub means. And, and the, the root word here, Shub, it means to return. To return requires a turn. You can't return unless you first turn. And if I'm leaving one destination and headed to another, in order for me to return to my original destination, I must make a U-turn. I hope you listen to what I'm saying. Listen. You cannot return if there is no U-turn. You must turn. Repentance is returning to God. Returning to the God you turn from. So if you are repenting to a brother or sister, you're returning as brother or sister. Else is not repenting if there's no return. Okay, so let's look at something. Let, let me... Um, That's a. Uh, hmm. First Kings eight, chapter thirty-three. I'm sorry, chapter eight, verse thirty-three. First Kings eight, verse thirty-three. I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm going to read some of it. It reads like this. When your people, Israel, are, de are defeated before their enemy because they have sinned against you, and if they turn again to you and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your people, Israel, and bring them again to the land that you gave to their fathers. But you see the word turn? And if they turn again to you, that's what repentance means. And you see this all through the Old Testament. Praise the Lord. Go to Hosea chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to read some of it. What does it say? Verse 5. Yes, hear this, O priest. Yeah, hear, you, hear you this, O priest. Hear you this, O priest. Come on. Hearken, you house of Israel. Pay attention, house of Israel. And give you ear. Give ear. O house of the king. O house of the king. For judgment is toward you. Judgment is towards you. Because you have been a snare on this. You've been a snare. And a net spread upon a, table. A net spread. Come on. And the revolters are profound to make slaughter. They've gone deep in the slaughter. Though I have been a rebuke of them all. Though I have rebuked them all. See, when we was talking about that earlier, how the Lord used all allowed all these things to happen. That was just for that was his mercy to get us to turn, right? Okay, go ahead. I know Ephraim and Israel is not hid from me. I know they're not hid from me. For now, O Ephraim, thou committest whoredom and you, Israel is defiled. Okay, what does he say? They will not frame their doings to turn unto their God. They will not refer, reframe their doings to turn unto their God. So that means they're turned away from them. So turn would mean what? To return. Yes, sir. Repent. To return to their God. Go ahead. For the spirit of whoredoms is in the midst of Okay, you can stop them. there. I just wanted to point it out that he already pointed out the sins. He says oh, they, they, they keep refraining from turning. Look at Ezekiel 18 and 26. 
The word teshuba means to turn, to return to God. It means that you turn, you make a U turn, make a U turn, you turn. You can't turn everybody, but turn yourself. All right. Ezekiel 18 and 26. Somebody read. Read. Ezekiel 8. Read it, please. When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness. So there are righteous people that have turned away from their righteousness. There were people that was once righteous. The Bible says the devil was perfect in all of his, all of his ways until iniquity was found in him. So that it is possible for righteous persons to turn away from their righteousness. It don't mean they was always unrighteous. And I hear some of you, there are some people, what they did is because that was always in them. Not necessarily. There are people that started out correctly and that ended up getting off. And you know, if you, if, as you judge yourself, wasn't there a time you felt that you were sincere and you maybe made some mistakes before? Yes, don't leave that untrue for other people and make it only true for yourself. So when a righteous person turns from his righteousness and what? And does iniquity. And he die, what? In, in it. For the iniquity that he done, he going to die in it. Because he turned away from righteousness. He turned away from the righteousness. What scripture says, return, O backsliding Israel, from your backsliding. And the Lord said, I know that you played the harlot. He went on about all of Israel's sins. But he told him to come back. To return. You see? These things, that's the meaning of Teshuvah. And we cannot allow what we hear to pervert that. To return requires a turn. It's turning from wrong, turning from ungodliness, turning from evil. Turning from the evil and the wrong and the ungodliness that you turn to, you now turn from. The other part of Teshuvah is Niham, and, it, and that's the other part of repenting. It means to return out of sorrow. So you're not only confessing, but you're returning out of sorrow and conviction. Because now you see the wrong, and you see you're on the wrong path. And that, and that conviction is used to, to, to give you the, the ultimatum of turning. You can turn to do what's right. And when a person turns to do what's right, the Lord said, the things I was going to do, I, I will refrain from doing. That's in the word of God. That when you turn from it, he said, I'll turn from the evils I was going to, all that stuff was about to happen to you. You know how many times you ought to be shouting right now about the many times we did repent in the nick of time. Or something crazy because of the calamities that was coming that God, amen, that, that, that when we turned to the Lord, we turned from the calamities that would have come upon us. We ought to be rejoicing right now for be, having the ability to repent. So it is that Teshuvah is not just a confession of one's mouth. It is also a turning, praise the Lord, in the heart and in direction. There are three levels of repentance. Repentance to the Lord. Repenting, saying that you're sorry to others and forgiving others. Those three stages. You don't want to mess any of those up. Repentance is the single factor to the existence of this world. Remember the Lord said, I'm going to destroy everything. Yes. Moses stood up, remember? Repenting. Talk to the Lord. Repentance brings healing into the world. Second Chronicles 2 and 14. Remember, if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray, then do what? Seek my face. And then what else? Turn. That's repentance. From the evil ways, or the wicked ways. Then what happens? I'll hear from heaven. You'll hear from heaven. You'll forgive the sins. You'll, forgive the sins. You'll, heal the You'll heal the entire land. So we're looking for all these healings. The healing is not in the mass. It's in repentance. If we only repent, then the Lord will send a healing through. It's not in that vaccine. We're always trying to find out a way to undo the things that turn us to the Lord. To ease the 
repercussions of, of, of our bad choices. We're always looking for ways, trying to outsmart God, when indeed God is just trying to get people to turn to. Praise the Lord. And in church, we have to forgive. We have to not only repent to the Lord, but it's, it's go to people you've offended and say you're sorry. No, open up your mouth. Don't give them a hundred dollars. You know, in the name, in, in the place of repentance. But repent and give them a hundred dollars if you led to. But don't don't give them a hundred dollars because a hundred dollars does not take the place of repentance. You have made salvation and repentance cheap. Because you cannot buy that with gold or silver. That cannot be purchased with money. You cannot play God cheap. All right, repentance brings healing. That's what it does. It brings redemption. If a man holds, listen at this. Let me give you this. Let me close on this. If a man holds a defiled object in his hand and washes his hands multiple times, guess what? He still remains defiled because he did not let go of the object, of the defiled object. But listen at this. Can I give you this wisdom? He's not yet clean, clean. But once he get rid of the defiling object, he can wash his hands one time and he will be made clean. If the, un, the defiling object is still in his hand and he's washing his hands, though he do it a thousand times, he's not clean. But if he get rid of the defiled object, he can wash his hands one clean, one time. He don't have to do it a thousand times, one time. And his hands will be clean. I hope that you have an understanding of this. We don't want to stand in, in damnation as believers and end up in a place with unbelievers because we carried ourselves like unbelievers. And I'm going to tell you, belief is very important, but if you're going to operate in Christ, behavior is just as important. And uh, it is in, it's imperative that our behavior reflect that of Christians. We're Christians. It should, re it should reflect Christian. It should reflect Christ. And we, we can't talk like God and live like the devil. We can't act like God and talk like the devil. <laughs> it's incompatible. I, I hope that you understand this. So forgive people. Ask God for forgiveness of your sins. Make that a part of your life. It makes no sense to get to heaven. Talking about you cast out demons and you prophesy. And the Lord said, I never knew you. <laughs> yeah, you used my name. You knew of me, but I don't know you. Isn't it important that he knows us? There's a whole lot of people saying, I know Jesus, but I, I want to know. Do he know you? This is pertinent questions. All right? I, I pray that I have helped you some. It's going to be something in you that says, you know what? The way that they did me, I don't feel like they deserve to be forgiven. Forgive them. So that you are not held up. And your sins are still upon you. Can you imagine thinking that you're good for 10 years and you've been repenting to the Lord all those years and yet you really in your heart of hearts haven't forgiven another person only to get to heaven to find out that you're going to hell. That's a horrible thing. That's horrible. Do you know how many people died like that? Oh, my God. Because their understanding of the Teshuvah was, was perverted. Do you, do you understand that? So forgive. I know the, I know the flesh will tell you try to hold on <laughs> and some of us we bury the hatchet but we hold on to the handle and you have to bury both the hatchet and the handle let it all go amen watch the Lord bless you stop looking at yourself as being vulnerable and weak because you say I'm sorry and or I forgive you but you're going to have that group that, that's going to make you look weak and there, there are um, uh, people who, who counsel people and say, well, when are you going to, you got to draw a line now. Yeah, you can draw a line of not letting people just constantly take advantage of you. But you can't draw a line of saying, I will never, I'm going to stop forgiving people. 
Because the moment you draw that line, your line is drawn too. You have to understand that. And I understand that there are gurus and people out there that are that are teaching people and you know you gotta stop letting people use. But the Bible says to pray for those that despitefully use you. Now, don't let them take no experience from Christendom from you because you need all of it to prove the kind of Christian that you should be. All of the experiences that you've had, you needed it in order to, for God to prove you. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Amen. He said, I try, I, I counsel you to buy gold tried in the fires. I want to know that this thing is real. We know that it works, but how do you know that it works unless you go through it? How do you know that you can really forgive unless somebody do something that's worth unforgiving? that you feel that's worth unforgiving. You don't really know. And I'm not talking about remedial things. Somebody stepped on your foot. Oh, I forgive you. You know, somebody bumped you by mistake. I'm sorry, excuse me. No, I ain't talking about that little stuff. I'm talking about somebody lied on you until it made you cringe. <laughs> you know it was a blatant lie. And you looking at them in their face and something in you saying, mm -hmm. you smiling. Yeah. But, you, but that smile ain't, I love you smile. That smile is like, you gonna get yours. <laughs> <laughs> No. Saints of God, this is this is real gospel teaching. This is real Christian teaching. Because it all points back to the cross. How many times should you forget a brother? The Bible asks. Jesus asked the disciples. Mm -hmm. they want, well, they wanted to know from him, how many times should you forgive a person? He said seven times seventy. That is a deep statement. That's a deep statement because by the, from the time that they were in Babylonian captivity, that Israel had come out of captivity up until Jesus died on the cross was 490 years. And the Lord was forgiving them all the way to the cross. So does forgiveness stop? Hmm? Seven times 70 is 490 times for the same exact sin. So they did three different things to you. You're supposed to be open to forgive them. 490 times for each, for all three of them. That's how your heart should be prepared. That I am prepared to forgive you. There's seven times 70. Seven times 70. That's 490 times. I don't have time to get into it, but that's dealing with seven Sabbaths. Yes, sir. I don't have time to get into it, but we are living, amen, we're living in the sixth dispensation and really in the last the Sabbath is coming after this. Amen. Which will be the which we will be the 49,000th year. Amen. And from that, amen, we go into eternity. I don't have time to get into that. If you want those, you have to get into my college. Amen. Amen. Bakar Kahal Bible College. It's a Judeo Christian college. And on you will see it on our page shortly. Amen. In the name of the Lord. And we'll go into those deeper teachings. All right. But the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you and make his face smile upon you. Listen, um, let me pray for you. Stretch your hands in this direction. Kind Father, we thank you. We glorify you. We magnify you. We lift you high, higher than all of the earth. You're so awesome. You're worthy to be praised, to be glorified, to be uplifted. And we do thank you right now. Lord, we stand asking you to forgive us for any sin we've committed. And yet in our heart of hearts, we forgive those who have trespassed against us. We release them, people. We release them. And help us not to be ashamed and not to be prideful to the point that we cannot go to people and apologize to them to say that we are sorry for offensive things, small or big. Help us, Lord, to be big in heart, to not only ask your, for your forgiveness, but to forgive others and to ask to be pardoned also. By others. I thank you right now. Let that rest upon us. Help us to remember that it points back to what you did on Calvary's cross. Help us not to do anything that undo what you did on the cross. Certainly help us not to crucify you afresh. Putting you back on the cross you came out off of and denying the power, Lord God, of forgiveness that you have demonstrated your love for us on the cross. That if we turn to you, you will turn to us. If we draw nigh to you, you will draw nigh to us. So, Father, we thank you and we glorify you. And we praise your holy name in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Listen, you can, would you all share a $7 gift 
amen on this evening. We would appreciate it. If you're able to, would you share that gift with us today? $7, amen. It will be in our PayPal account, C, the letter C, Apostolic Revival, all one word, at gmail.com. C, the letter C, Apostolic Revival at gmail.com. It is all one word. And if you share that, we would be so grateful. Amen to that. Or whatever it is that you would like to share on tonight. We thank you for your liberal giving. And we, we bless the Lord for you. Uh, I need somebody, uh, Sister Wally, if you would please look into. Okay, yeah, we want to look into the information so we can see if we can bless this young lady with some pampers or whatever she needs for her children to be able to help her. In the precious name of Jesus, we believe in, in demonstrating real Christian virtues. That's what Christians do. Hallelujah, glory to God. And uh, we love you all on uh, tonight. I look forward to you joining me at 5 p.m. in prayer on tomorrow. And Wally, if you could put that number on there. You know, uh, this morning, I forgot the number. That's what, uh, yesterday, I forgot the number. I was panicking, running all through the house, because normally the number's in my phone. I could pull it up and just yes, dial it. But so many uh, numbers push, uh, phone calls push the number out of my system. Praise the Lord. Some of you may have called me, and I want to explain to you that the way my phone will freeze up, and it just it's just bombarded with information, calls, and texts. So um, if um, your number comes in and it seems as I didn't call you, it could be that your number was pushed out of my system. Okay, because after a couple of days, all the numbers coming in will push those numbers out of my system, and I won't know who called. I don't ignore phone calls. We love you, and I enjoy to help you and love you as a shepherd should. Praise the Lord. Listen, God bless you. I look to see you on um, on Friday at, at, at 8.15, amen, Shark. And I want to say this to you. We're looking for uh, creative ways to go back in. I understand that my brother and friend, Apostle Carter, they went in, and um, they had a, a wonderful experience going in. People can plot. They wasn't complaining. They went and they were happy and in compliance and they all went in wearing masks. Praise the Lord. And so we thank the Lord for Amen. Uh that in Jesus' precious name. Have somebody already sent her something? Sister Charisma, I see where you said Target or Walmart pickup. Columbus, Georgia. I'm not I'm not understanding what's happening. Can somebody can somebody call me and let me know what we've done for Sister Lornell uh, for, for Wiley? Yes, if nobody's done anything, I just need to know. And maybe that's what she's doing. She's texting where, she, where they can pick it up. Please let me know or, or text Pastor Span so we can handle this tonight. All right, in Jesus' name. Uh, so we want to look for creative ways to go in, and we'll try to use it all the way up until the wintertime kind of get in. All right, so we play it. I do want to do two virtue services, two live virtue services. I want to do one live virtue service. Praise the Lord. God bless. Okay, Sister Charisma, let me know um, what is needed. So how we, well, that's a brother. If I called him sister, I apologize. Please let him know my apologies if I, Okay, I don't know if, I'm sorry, whoever it was, all right, praise the Lord, glory to the Lord, the Lord bless you, okay, all right, we're going to definitely help, glory to God, we're going to definitely help, listen, again, uh, keep us in prayer, we look to see you on Friday, amen, remember this Sunday, we will be doing service from virtue. And we're going to do some creative things, so be prepared for some of the creative things that we're doing. And um, our sanctuary has been remodeled and been refreshed. It's going to be awesome. Amen. As we go in, just really, really an awesome experience. Amen. Praise the Lord. Being in God's presence. And God's presence is pertinent because that's where we want to be. May the Lord God bless you real good. I look to see you. Amen. Um, uh, tomorrow at 5 p.m.